The Last Dance, episode three and four are finally out on Netflix now. Dennis Rodman edition for episode three. It's time to go. Let's celebrate. Let's go. What's up everybody, it's the Sports Code aka Aiden, welcome back to another video. This is the Last Dance Michael Jordan documentary review, episode 3. So um, this just came out today, very very uh, good episode again, I mean all these episodes have been pretty amazing really, so uh, yeah, so this version is going to be about the Dennis Rodman side of being in that team and also Again, it's all about MJ. It's always about Michael Jordan. So there's always going to be Michael Jordan in, in this one. And how the two careers kind of join together, man. So a very interesting topic, especially with Dennis Rodman, because he's definitely the out one, out there type of person. He's the one with mixed bags. Either people love him or people hate him. But at the end of the day, he's very successful for both the Pistons and the Chicago Bulls. So he's definitely part of history and very good part of history as well for us. So without further ado, I would like to ask for you guys to please like and subscribe to my YouTube channel, The Sports Code, um, and turn notifications on. We have a lot of uh, videos coming out for you guys. And uh, I, like I said, man, I upload twice a day, but if I can get this past midnight in Australia time, this will be the third video today, so I'm very excited about that, man. But without further ado, let's get started to the Dennis Rodman episode. So, um, it was basically talking about, at the very beginning, how Dennis Rodman was kind of, uh, had accountability issues. So, it kind of started off, okay, Scottie Pippen isn't playing for the Chicago Bulls at the moment. He still hasn't made up his mind. So, Dennis Rodman is that guy, is that person to be held accountable when Michael Jordan was um, needed someone the most. They were talking about how the Bulls constantly kept losing, but um, we didn't. they didn't know how when they were going to get their next, their next win, if they were going to get a, a good record. And it, it came into a lot of controversy, really. So it started off with um, Dennis Rodman coming into Michael Jordan's uh, hotel and basically just... Being that guy, being that guy, it's 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 the two, it's both of their mentalities together, and they started to win more games, and um, that's uh, that's basically it in terms of the the Bulls area, and um, so with Dennis Rodman finally kind of being like, okay, this is us two against the world, and they did very well. They started to win the games, and um, he became a, a, a spokesperson in the locker room for Michael Jordan. And um, it ended up going into his childhood once again, growing up in a very uh, bad neighborhood, I would say, a poor neighborhood. Ended up getting kicked out from his parents for two years living on the streets because he wasn't really providing for anybody, not his family, not his uh, friends or anybody like that. So he um, he had to live on people's couches. He had to live on people's uh, in people's houses, backyards, all of that just in order to survive really and he talked about how he saw a lot of things he saw drugs he saw um illegal shit but he ended up um turning away from that turning against that to go and play basketball and it ended up working very well for him he became one of the more successful players in the nba as, as a total and he for that he got a reward he got drafted i believe the 27th pick to the Detroit Pistons, and that's where the formation really the Bad Boy Pistons began, as he became a defensive monster. And they talked about how he learned his defense, how he learned his craft, how he learned the different angles that the ball would hit the rim and where he would be. How he learned how people's moves, how um, he knows exactly where to position himself at a certain type of shot. Very, very, very elegant um, studying of the game. From a player that what we didn't really think would be that type of player, but he studied the game tremendously well. And in the end, he became one of the best defensive players that basketball has ever seen, which is, um, that's such a high honor to put among anybody. What a great defender he was. He truly was a fantastic defender. And, um, there, at, and it worked out for him. And um, it kind of went on about how good he was in, in Detroit. But then... Um, 
it went more into the into the Bulls side. How um, back in the 1989 season, I believe, um, how the Bulls were going, which they weren't clearly, they weren't the best team in the East at the time, but uh, they definitely had, um, they were rising up, they were winning games, and it all started from hiring Doug Collins. Doug Collins was a very youthful coach at the time, um, bringing his, uh, his youth, his excitement, his passion, and everything into um, these games where the Bulls were a very young team. So it kind of made sense to get a young coach so they can both grow together, experience, and have the same passion that an uh, older coach might just not might not have or might present in a different way. Um, Doug Collins wanted to win, and it was clear and obvious that he wanted to win. You could tell by his sweat that he, he sweats his ass off every game, almost like he was playing. Um, he would he would ensure that the training was at an elite level, has um, the willingness to keep the mind sharp, and he did that very well. And that's why Michael Jordan and Doug Collins had a fantastic relationship. And um, I think the quote was from Doug Collins, who actually did have an interview sequence within this episode. He said, when I was coaching Michael Jordan, he won the MVP. He was the reigning MVP. He was all-star MVP, slam dunk contest winner, and defensive player of the year. That was all of the accolades he achieved while being coached under Doug Collins. And that's when he kind of solidified himself as the greatest player. And... Um, that's that's a very young Michael Jordan. He's been in the league for a few years now, but but he's slowly becoming the, the best player in the world. Not slowly, but he was definitely becoming the best player in the world. And um, it all led to the playoffs. Now, uh, they said in the in the documentary, they mentioned that Detroit was uh, clearly the team to beat in the East. They beat the Celtics one year, and um, they just didn't know which team. Uh, it would be that they would have to that would challenge the Detroit Pistons. Would it be um, the Chicago Bulls or would it be the Cleveland Cavaliers? And this is this led to one of the most iconic matchups in um, Eastern Conference history and Finals history, really. So it ended up being um, uh, I think it was a Game Six or a Game Seven. Uh, you guys can let me know about that 1989 Eastern Conference matchup, and um, it, it went. It went very well to these two teams were battling. Michael Jordan had great game after great game after great game. But um, it all led down to the final shot between the Cavs and MJ and the Bulls to see who would go through, who would qualify. After the Cavs made a very good shot that led to a three-second buzzer beater by Michael Jordan. And we all know the iconic reaction after he made that. And the story behind how he made that as well. Um, saying that all these reporters that doubted me, go to hell, get out of here, go home, and all of this. He truly believed that he could get the job done, and he got the job done, and his team got the job done, and they were the ones that were going to challenge the Detroit Pistons coming into the, the next round. And that's, um, that's kind of what happened, and that's when this entire rivalry started between the Pistons and the Bulls. So this was 1989, of course, the bad boy Pistons with Dennis Rodman, um, Isaiah Thomas, and uh, and all of the bad boy Pistons, really. Like, the whole team was just so ruthless. Uh, they were they were cutthroat. They, were, they would destroy people on the court. And um, they ended up playing extremely physical, and it was allowed back then. So that's why no one really had a problem like they've just brought a lot of physicality and personalism towards the the team and um mj and the bulls they had to stand up and fight and they fought and they fought very well but then they created something they created the jordan rule which is basically any time that michael jordan tries to go into the air you knock him down you throw him to the floor you physically hurt him and um that was something that had to be adapted by because there wasn't Michael Jordan. They were trying to make sure Michael Jordan wasn't going to get out of this series at all, really. And um, it took a lot for the GOAT to truly be the GOAT. But I think if he didn't go through this experience of um, this Jordan rule, he would have never become the player that he is. I honestly believe that because they put him through the ringers. They brought him through so much pain and physically and emotionally and mentally. That now, when we look back, you think to yourself, 
like if this if he didn't go through this would he be meant as mentally tough as he was a lot of people could say yes but this just added another level to that and that's what i got out of that um section of the of the documentary and um in the end they ended up uh winning beating the chicago bulls in that series and they ended up winning the championship so that was the first championship the bad boy pistons won and it was at michael jordan's expense and um it just shows that, that the rivalry between the Pistons and the Bulls started very early and it went out through pretty much his entire career and it never went away really, not at all. And um, that's 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 where it was, man. And uh, uh, Dennis Rodman got one over Michael Jordan. It flashed forward to 1993 and it had, uh, uh, they were talking about Dennis Rodman um, with a gun. And that was a very scary time for the Detroit Pistons, Dennis Rodman and his fans. And Dennis Rodman, when commenting on it, said, I was in a car with a with a handgun, um, but I, I, luckily I fell asleep. And when I woke up, the police came and got me. So that was, uh, that was a, a, a piece of information that was so scary. And so, um, so I guess you could say, like it was just so frightening and it was just, it was just, a situation where you'd never expect it. No one really knew about Dennis Rodman's um, kind of being stuck in this space where he couldn't leave, he couldn't say anything, and he couldn't really, um, he couldn't handle the media aspect or everything outside the actual game of basketball, which he hated. And um, this, in the end, got him traded to the Spurs. And then his frustration by playing with the Spurs, either no respect, the Spurs weren't the greatest team then, I, I guess. But um, he ended up coming to the Bulls and uh, the Bulls were crazy enough to make a signing like that, make a signing that could potentially ruin their franchise or help them win a championship. And um, I guess they had the pieces in place to where they could handle a Dennis Rodman type character where Dennis Rodman wasn't, um, he was definitely the standout, but he definitely wasn't going to run amok like he did it with the Spurs. And uh that eventually led to uh, back into the main season, back into the 1997-98 season, when um, when they they showed all the highlights again of them winning games, highlight play after highlight play, and then they finally mentioned Scottie Pippen. Now we all know at the end of the day that Scottie Pippen did return with the Bulls, but we don't know why. And Scottie Pippen had a good um, insight here, saying, "I wasn't going to let the franchise benefit." off of finding me, off of all this if I never returned. So I decided to play because he knew that they weren't going to trade him. And um, of, of course, Scotty Pippen is way more intelligent than people give him credit for. So this 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 ended up working out for both parties, really. And um, it definitely worked out for Scotty Pippen. And uh, and he, he returned, and he returned very well. He dropped a lot of points uh, in his first game. I think it was 14 points, four rebounds, five assists. Which is okay. It was a good game for for Scottie Pippen on his day back. But when the team started to come together, um, Dennis Rodman wasn't the main guy anymore to help Michael Jordan. He kind of needed a vacation. To which, uh, if this ever happened in today's NBA, if someone asked for a vacation <laughs> during the season, I don't think that would go down well with anybody. So, um, but th it was a different story back then. And he actually got a vacation for two days. He went to Las Vegas and he partied and he got um, everything that I guess uh, it was a refresher. It was a, it was recharging the batteries so he can go on for the rest of the season. Then also mentioned again how hard it is to deal with the media presence, to deal with all the, in his terms, bullshit that was um, going on besides the game of basketball. So uh, that's that was basically how things went off. And that was the Dennis Rodman side of um, the uh, Chicago Bulls documentary, the Last Dance documentary. We finally got to get a little bit of an insight into um, Dennis Rodman's career and his childhood and all of that. And um, this this documentary is moving on very nicely. And I haven't seen episode four yet. I will, I will be watching it and giving you a review probably tomorrow, so stay tuned for that. But episode three, it's really moving on nicely, man. I'm very excited to see the next one. I want to see who they talk about next. I want to see the controversies that I would never know next. So um, 
Dennis Rodman, he's an interesting character, isn't he? He's definitely unique. And people claim that he's a terrible person or because he's um, the way that he behaves or the way that he acts is... Um, it's an indication that he's not a good person, but he even said himself, the media has to write and the media can set anybody out to be a terrible person. You could be the nicest person in the world, but once the media gets their hands on something, they can destroy a person. So in a way, that's probably what's, what really happened to Dennis Rodman. But again, he's he was just too good for people to not take seriously. And his words me meant something. And when he spoke, people listened because he was an honest bloke. He was an honest person that um, even though he, he, he didn't represent the NBA well in terms of the media, he, he spoke the truth. And sometimes the truth is the most impactful voice that anybody could talk. So um, I applaud Dennis Rodman for stuff like this. Of course, professionalism is key in a lot of um, modern day NBA press conferences and all of this, but sometimes the truth it needs to be spoken more than anything. And that's um, the message I got out of this documentary just as much as anything. Always speak the truth, man. Never leave, never leave anything to the imagination. If something comes out, you have to speak the truth. And it, it could, it could um, ruin a reputation, but it could also create one that is very, very iconic. And that's why Dennis Rodman's considered an icon for many people outside of the Bulls and with the Bulls as well. So I want to thank you all for watching. Uh, please like, subscribe if you're new to the channel. Stay tuned for part four of the uh, the Last Dance documentary review, reaction, um, produced by Michael Jordan, of course. And um, yeah, man, this is the Sports Code. Have a wonderful and safe day. See you all later. Take care. Peace.